In today's episode, we're diving into digestion. We start off talking about if Alex and I fart in front of one another, but being able to give you guys the tools with a digestion starter pack that you need to make sure that your digestion is optimal. We define what good and bad digestion is, as well as how it affects your health overall. So make sure that you share this with a friend that might be struggling with digestion, as well as to make sure to give us a like, comment, and subscribe. We'll see you guys on the inside. Alex, I was thinking about something the other day, and I'm, I don't really understand it. So what's the deal with there being like a middle school and a junior high? What is even the <laughs> difference? I don't get it. I mean, it is middle school is three grades and junior high is just two. Oh, is that really the difference? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but like, middle school is sixth, seventh, and eighth grade. And then junior high, I think, is just eight, seventh and eighth grade. So if junior high is seventh and eighth grade, then a sixth grade just like is it K through six instead yeah. of K through five? Yeah. I mean, where like how I grew up was elementary school was kindergarten through sixth grade. And then we had junior high. But then I think now they do a middle, now it's a middle school. So they do K through five and then six through eight mm -hmm. at the middle school and then they have obviously high school i feel like there's such a big difference between fifth grade and sixth grade yeah i think that well you start to have school sports as well oh yeah that's true so then you start to have a basketball team i don't think you have like a football team or anything like that but you have basketball volleyball that kind of stuff so you, it's a big transition and like just maturing wise as a child you're going through some individuals are going through more growth spurts and those different things i was not one of those people <laughs> So you you just had a seventh and eighth grade. Yeah. So how was it being in sixth grade with all the elementary school? You just ruled the roost. You were the coolest kid on campus type situation. Did you have school sports then? Like yeah. just in sixth grade? Yeah. So your elementary school didn't have school sports, but sixth grade did. Right. It didn't seem weird because it was all that we knew. Like every surrounding school was the same way. Everybody had a junior high. There wasn't really a middle school around us. Huh. Yeah. So like you would have, would you play at like the middle or the junior high? I can't believe high, how fascinated you are by this. <laughs> you would play at the junior high fields or did your elementary school have its own fields for those school sports? I don't entirely remember. You ha I mean, you had your own basketball courts. Yeah. We had basketball courts in elementary yeah, school. Yeah. So, I mean, I was on the basketball team in, in uh, sixth grade and then for like baseball and stuff, it was other places. And for football, you were still playing like youth football. You weren't, okay. there was no sixth grade football teams. You had junior high football teams though. Yeah, we were in middle school because we had six through eight for middle school. There was only a handful of sports that you could do in sixth grade. Mm -hmm. Actually, I don't even think you could do most sports in sixth grade. I don't recall, honestly. I can't believe, I don't even know what the relevance to this is. I, I was just thinking about it yesterday. <laughs> I just was real curious. I didn't know how common it was if it was like area dependent, school district dependent, like, oh, everything in the Midwest is a middle school versus a junior high. It's just always kind of confused me because I feel like they're just the same thing. And I thought that they're just different terms used for the same thing. I think there's much more complex and necessary things to be confused about than <laughs> junior high or middle school. Well, you know, that's one of the things that we're going to get into today, <laughs> which is digestion, yeah. which I know a lot of people struggle with their digestion, myself included. Of I've talked about having IBS and navigating through all of that, but I know that within our clients, we see a lot of digestive issues and just the questions that we get on Instagram, the questions we get on YouTube are all really directed towards digestion and wanting to improve that. Right. I think that it is a growing topic of, of knowledge. It's a growing data of, of studying of studies right now. And so I think that people are just becoming more self-aware because I don't, I think that when we, when we started coaching, I think back you know, 10 years ago, I don't think that many people were having the conversation on IBS and gut microbiome and all the intricate details of the uh, gut brain access and all these different things. So I think that it's just the growing body of literature that is allowing for people to have a better understanding and people are becoming more aware of why they may be experiencing pain and those different factors and it not just being like, that's just how I am. I try to, I'm just trying to figure it out. I'm just trying to, I don't know what's going on. It's just how I am. Yeah. 
Yeah, I would say that is definitely true of just more access to information as well and more conversation within the connectivity of the whole world with like, you know, technology definitely playing a role. It's one of those taboo conversations that many have avoided wanting to talk about poop and all those <laughs> things. So, Well, girls don't poop, apparently. Apparently to some. <laughs> we, we asked the Instagram story, uh, gosh, a couple days ago. Mm -hmm. I would say the greater majority of individuals said that they do fart in front of their, or pass gas. I apologize. My, if my mom is <laughs> listening, she's going to be very upset that I said fart. Um that the greater majority of individuals do pass gas in front of their uh, significant other. Now, the individuals who have not, I had someone spin, send me a DM and said that they had been married for 16 years or something. She's never farted. There's literally in front no of her way. And I, that's why I said, I said, that's a, a total lie. You have definitely let a silent one rip at some point. Yeah, you have to have. At some point, you've let it fly. There's no way that you've just been bottling up every bit of gas that you've ever had in front of you. I mean, maybe, I don't know. I, I think that some individuals are just more mentally tough than I in that situation, <laughs> but I'm just not built that way. Yeah, I it's think- It's more so you're not built that way. Oh, I'm definitely not built that way. And I, I, I was about to say, like, I don't know what normal is when it comes to how much gas, but I, I do technically. It's just that I know what my normal is just within having IBS. And I also know, like, how uncomfortable it is to hold in a fart. And with how much time we spend together, I just like, it's not worth the discomfort for myself or it's for totally you. Fine. And so we just, you know, let it fly. Yep. <laughs> and it's, I mean, it's, it's funny. I'm still a child in that sense. Oh, that yeah. I, I find it humorous. Yeah. Laugh every time or poke fun every yeah, time. I think it's still funny. Yeah. I hope I find it forever funny. Honestly, yeah. I don't see any reason not to find it funny. Yeah. Well, I appreciate that we can do that in front of one another. Yeah. Uh, but getting into the topic of digestion. So digestion is going to be how your body breaks down and assimilates food and nutrients and using it for energy, growth, and cell repair. So there are going to be multiple organs and steps along the way when it comes to your digestion. And it actually starts in your mouth uh, and it goes through the GI tract, but your liver, your gallbladder, and your pancreas are also needed for digestion. And it's one of the most important aspects of a healthy body. A healthy gut is at the center of a healthy life. And you've likely heard someone say before you are what you eat, but it's not that you are what you eat, it's you are what you digest or assimilate. And so it's normalized that many people suffer with digestive issues like bloating and constipation, as well as chronic issues like IBS and celiac disease. But just just because something is common does not mean it's normal. Um, and uh, digestion is going to be the root of many other bodily functions. So getting your digestion on track is an important key to your overall health. And I know I've seen a lot of trends on Instagram of um, I've seen girls specifically showing their bodies like at the beginning of the day and then showing as the day goes on. And it's their, their stomach like distending as the day goes on and they're like bloating is normal. And I think that a very common distinction is just because something is common doesn't mean that it's normal. And so I have a little bit of a bone to pick with the people that post that of, yes, your body does change throughout the day. You're not going to look exactly the same as when you wake up because you are eating food and having like water in you and all that jazz. But it's not going to be, quote, normal to have this large distension as you're going through the day. I think that it's important to decipher between bloating and distension. Yes. Bloating is going to be more of your stomach feeling hard and you can't pull it in. Distension is going to be more of just your stomach is distended. It's it's assimilating food. You just you know ate a bolus of nutrients, those different factors. That's going to be natural. The bloating aspect of having a hard, painful, can't pull in your stomach uh, situation every time you eat, that's a problem. That's something that needs to be addressed. And so being able to have the two terms be different is important because they're interchanged too frequently. And then individuals can't really decipher between the two and then are finding themselves in a situation where it's like, I connect with what that person's saying. It's like, that's not is actually what is happening to you. That's different. And so that's something to that is important for people to connect the dots on. Yeah. And I think also being able to just define what does it mean 
brain to have good or bad digestion because on our check-in sheets, we ask about people's digestion. And I remember when I first started coaching, people would be like, oh, it's good because they felt uncomfortable talking about digestion, but they also didn't know what was considered good or bad. They just knew what their normal was. And I came to find out and I learned this pretty early on in coaching that I had to be specific about what good and bad digestion was, as well as what I wanted clients to express was going on with their digestion and really take away that that taboo feeling of like, it's it's not weird, it's not TMI, let's talk about this, this is our body. Uh, but being able to like realize, hey, going three days without a bowel movement is not going to be good digestion, that is going to be bad digestion. And just because again, it's your normal does not mean that it's the normal, it's something that we do want to be able to address. Right. And I think that, yeah, establishing kind of those guardrails, if you will, of this is good and this is bad, or this is kind of we're trending towards bad or we're trending towards good type situation is is a good place to for us to start. So I think that having a bowel movement potentially every other day is not great, but it can be your situation. I think that individuals who are in the depths of a dieting phase, for example, who are maybe later into a contest prep and total volume of food is low, they may only have a bowel movement every other day and their digestion be okay. But for the general person who is eating at, at maintenance or something along those lines in that realm, having a bowel movement every other day is probably trending towards not good. We've got something to address. And then if you're having a bowel movement, maybe every third day, we're going to categorize that as not good digestion or bad digestion. Then on the flip side, if we're having too frequent of bowel movements, then we think about, okay, if we're having more than three bowel movements a day, and the stools are not solid, that's probably a sign that we're trending towards bad or that could be bad. We'll, we'll label that as bad because there are individuals that I've worked with that are um, athletes who are trying to put on large amounts of muscle tissue eating four, five, 6,000 calories a day that having three bowel movements a day is probably necessary for the total volume of food that they're consuming. Um, but for the individual who is maybe again, eating at maintenance, let's say 2000 calories a day, having three bowel movements a day is probably trending towards not good. So it's always going to be circumstantial when we put these guardrails in place and looking at it individually for you when you're listening to this as the listener um, and, and making sure that as you're kind of addressing your own digestion, that you have an understanding of what how it applies to you directly. Yeah. And we're going to, this is actually going to be part one of the digestion podcast and the digestion starter pack really to help you understand your digestion and have really applicable things to see and address your own digestive issues. Uh, but when we're diving into this as well, it's important to look at the over time of how it looks. So if you have one day or let's say a week of you have more bowel movements than normal or you have looser stools than normal, but you also have really high stress that week, maybe you got food poisoning or something to that degree. Yes, you had bad digestion for that week, but that doesn't mean overall you have bad digestion. So really being able to look at, okay, what is my average? What is my normal? And then being able to dissect from there of what all's going on. So another one to be able to break down is kind of how you feel after you eat. If you have pain after you eat or discomfort, uh, but also if you feel like extremely lethargic. Now that could be due to having too many carbs or eating too much at once, but if you're not properly breaking down your food, food should give you energy. And so if you are feeling really tired after you eat uh, food and it's a normal amount of food, then that could also be a sign of, hey, my digestion is not in the absolute best spot. Whereas if you eat food, you feel good, you feel energized, and you feel like it does give you that boost, then that can be, hey, I, my body is breaking this down well, and I'm being able to utilize this food. Right. And there's so many things that our digestion and our overall gut health are going to affect or play a role in within our overall health. And we're going to dig into that here shortly. But as we go through the, the starter pack, we're going to have different tiers. And today we're going to share with you our first two tiers. And then in the second part, we're going to give you tier three and tier four. But let's go ahead and get started with how many different things is our gut health and digestion going to be impacting from an overall health standpoint? Yeah. 
So your nutrient absorption, which is also going to go into those energy levels, but the they are separate things when we look at nutrient absorption and energy levels because, again, the nutrients that we have of looking at all the micronutrients, that's going to play a role as far as malabsorption or not. So your nutrient absorption, your energy levels, and your immune system function, where a lot of times people think, oh, okay, I'm bloated, that's not that big of a deal. But if we really look at, again, the full picture of everything that it's going to affect Um, the digestive system is going to play a critical role in preventing the entry of harmful bacteria and viruses into the body. So poor digestion can actually weaken the immune system and increase the risk of infections. Yes. And I think that one of the biggest ones that clients notice as we improve their digestion is their skin health. Skin health is a huge one where I have clients coming uh, to us that are struggling with with acne, body acne, facial acne, anything of that nature. And we address their training because that's going to be a big part of it as well. Uh, the stress that is being put on their body from the resistance training. But a big part of this is going to come down to digestion, food selection, and, and how well the digestion is functioning. Yeah, 100%. And I've noticed that myself of as my digestion has improved of being able to address some of the things within IBS, because just because you might have a a chronic disease like IBS, IBD, or celiac doesn't mean that you can't improve your circumstance as a whole. And there are things that you can do um, to look out for that. So my skin health has definitely improved. And a big part of why that helps is because uh, poor digestion can cause inflammation, which can cause that skin health to be in a worst spot. Um, But also mental health, which I see big time, again, for myself as well as for clients. So there's actually a brain-gut axis. And so they do affect one another. And I don't just like to use anecdotes, but I will say for myself, when my digestion and my gut health was the absolute worst was when my mental health was the absolute worst as well. So that's something we often hear from clients of being able to improve and also playing into just being able to look at the the context of that, if you're having better energy, if you're getting the nutrients that you need, that's obviously going to improve how you feel as a whole. Right. Yeah. And I think that as we look at the the mental health component, it's something where you know that if, if you're dealing with the bloating and you are feeling just a rock in your stomach, it weighs on you so heavily. Like yeah. it, you, your scale weight may shift. It may be a pound or two, but you're in your mind, it feels like 10 pounds is just on your shoulders. 20 pounds is on your shoulders type situation because it's something that you feel that you can change and you do have the power to change. But at that current moment, it feel, you feel kind of helpless in the whole situation. And it's very defeating. And I think that having these tiers that we're speaking through today and understanding them and implementing them into your day-to-day life and, and how some of these things may need to change or maybe you're doing some of these things very, very well already. I think that these things are going to help a lot of these individuals who maybe are feeling a little bit more helpless or feeling that uh, they're struggling with their digestion at this moment. Yeah. So before we dive into the tiers, I do want to go ahead and say that if you're unsure of how your bowel movement should look, to go ahead and look up the Bristol stool chart. We'll have it linked in the show notes um, below as well. But this is going to show you kind of on a scale um, of like, having like more pebble poops to like having very loose stools of what is going to be considered normal. And that might help you a lot as well. If you are seeing, oh, I'm having more of this type of bowel movement, then this is going to be helpful for me moving forward. Um, And a few other symptoms that you might feel outside of the bloating that we talked about is going to be abdominal pain, indigestion, constipation, diarrhea, gas, nausea, fatigue, changes in appetite, acid reflux. Um, And then you can even have like a foul smelling breath or your stool bowel movements and stools are really bad smelling as well. If you are a bikini competitor who has competed well at the regional stage or at the national stage and not placed how you wanted, I would love the opportunity to work with you. If you would inquire via the link in the description box, that would be the first step. And from there, we'll get a call scheduled and I look forward to speaking with you. All right, so diving into this tier system, and this is something that we use within our clients to really make sure that we're we're hitting everything. We're looking at every box, and we're not just looking at food. So actually, these first two tiers 
don't really talk about your food sourcing, and that's something that we'll get in into part two. But tier one is really going to be looking at your habits and routine because you might be experiencing an issue with your digestion just due to the habits and routines you have around food as a whole. So what's something that you notice within clients when it comes to their habits and routine that might cause their digestion to be off? Waiting too long to eat waiting far too long to eat. And so I implement a tool that is a hunger scale of one to 10. And so one being stuffed full, 10 being I'm so ravenous, just shove something in my mouth, doesn't matter what it is, as long as it makes me feel less hungry at this moment, I don't care. And so what I recommend for clients is going to be a making sure that they're starting to prepare food when they're at about a six or a seven on that scale. Because once we get into eight, nine, and 10, our decision-making and our selection (laughs) of nutrients gets a little bit less quality. We're not necessarily reaching for the best thing or the thing that truly fits our macros. We're oftentimes just reaching for the thing that's going to be the fastest. And so having the wherewithal of like, okay, I'm at about a five and a half. I'm at a six. I'm maybe at a seven. It's time for me to start preparing food so that by the time I'm done preparing the food, I'm ready to eat and I haven't got myself to that ravenous point. And so that kind of leads us into one of our uh, pieces here of the speed. The speed in which you're consuming your nutrients is going to play a very large role in how well we're absorbing it, as well as how your digestion is going to respond to the consumption of this food. Are we thoroughly chewing our nutrients and those different factors? And so if we allow for ourselves to get to that eight, nine, or 10 hunger, that speed is going to go very quickly. Through the roof. Been there. (laughs) Been there. (laughs) Been there. Been there many a times. (laughs) And I have a lot of clients who have been there all the time. And they find themselves in a situation as we implement this hunger scale that they're no longer experiencing that. And it's a big relief for them because this is an easy fix that you can have just at the next meal up type situation. And so addressing the speed is going to be a a big part of things. So you're telling me I can be eating food that the same exact meal and feel great after eating at one time and feel not great after eating another time just due to how fast I eat it? Yeah, I think that uh, most definitely. It's one of those situations that if you're just staring down at the bowl and shoveling the spoon directly into your mouth and not breathing and then doing like a chomp, chomp, swallow type approach, been there again. (laughs) (laughs) All from experience. Yeah, all from experience. Uh, If you're living that life, that is something that is going to definitely play a large role in, in how your digestion responds. Yeah, and it's something that it's also linked to consuming more food in general because you haven't given your your stomach a chance to like talk to your brain of like, hey, I'm full. You're eating so quickly that you don't have a chance to even be in tune. And that's where I find that hunger signals are even more off of, okay, I waited far too long to eat. Now I ate way too fast, which then I probably ate too much as well, possibly. And then I'm in this place where I just do not feel well whatsoever, but I needed to eat. And so it just kind of turned into a slippery slope because of that. Um, So this is one thing that I often challenge clients to do is first I put a time limit on their food or I have them time themselves. And I have clients come back and they'll be like, oh, it took me six minutes to eat my breakfast or it took me nine minutes to eat my lunch. And I'm like, all right, let's aim for 20 or 30 minutes. You mean time minimum, not limit. Yes, sorry, time minimum that I put in place of just urging them to try and hit that time frame uh, because I even found myself doing this of I was really only allotting like 10 or 15 minutes to eat a meal and try to get back to work. And now I really put into my calendar of, hey, it's going to take me 30 minutes to eat this meal so that I... I'm planning for it. I'm not trying to rush through it. And then another thing that's a great tip is setting your fork or your food down in between bites. If you are holding like your fork or your spoon the whole time that you're eating your meal or you're holding the food the whole time, that might be a sign of, hey, I might need to set this down, chew my food, and then be able to pick it back up and eat. I'm a naturally slow eater. Very naturally, that's just my norm as a whole. And when we first uh, started dating slash when we first got married, my slow approach to how I ate led you to believe I didn't like the food. Do you remember that? Yeah. Your parents still kind of do that sometimes. I was over, I took your parents' lunch, I don't know, last week or whatever. I'm eating at my normal pace. And your dad goes, 
do you not like it? I'm like, what do you mean? Do I not like it? <laughs> I, I'm like, I'm just eating at normal pace. And your mom chimed in and was like, that's just how he eats. Leave him alone. <laughs> <laughs> well, funny enough, I grew up being the slowest eater in my family. Which is wild. Which is so wild. And then I basically, as I grew up, started eating faster and faster. And then with like uh, in college, my schedule was really crazy. And then once we got married, our schedule was really crazy. So it was just boom, 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 boom. Um, one after another. Uh, but I actually was over at my parents a few weeks ago and I was eating a meal and I was practicing like putting my spoon down because I've been really trying to be conscientious of the speed at which I'm eating. And my dad was like, are you already done with that food? And I was like, no, I'm taking a break. Like we're talking. I'm trying not to talk and eat at the same time because I eat my food so much quicker if I'm trying to converse at the same time. And so just slowing down, setting my Which is hilarious because I'm the opposite of that. If I'm talking, then that slows me down tremendously. I feel like I end up like trying to take in too much air and eat at the same time. And it's a whole conundrum. Speaking of all that, <laughs> another a another aspect is environment. Yes. Getting all that figured out and putting yourself in a place that is going to be relaxing as, as much as we can do this, right? Like it's not always within our control to eat every meal in this peaceful harmony and have just uh, relaxing music playing and, and just have <laughs> all the time in the world. Like there's reality to this that we understand, but as much as we can control our environment and put ourselves in a comfortable situation, we want to do that. Yeah. And so one thing to ask yourself is looking at how you are eating your food. Are you eating your food in the car? Are you eating it like on the go? Are you eating it at your desk? Um, or again, are you kind of in a place where there's a lot going on around you and you're not able to focus on your food and you just end up scarfing it down? Um, that can all play a role. So being able to really look at who you're eating with too, as that can have influence um, or like how messy or tidy the space is can really influence kind of how you're feeling and what that looks like as far as the stress. Because with us talking about speed, when you're eating really fast, that can also cause your, your heart rate to increase and that can cause you to be in a fight or flight mode. And we want to be in the rest and digest mode because that's what we're focusing on. And so being able to make sure that you are in a place that is a good place to eat your food. But then again, looking at that heart rate and chewing. So those are two of the other ones um, that I like to go into. And heart rate specifically is one that I find is often overlooked, especially post-training. Or again, if someone is really busy and they're running around and then they sit down to eat, their heart rate might still be pretty elevated. And it's very, very difficult for your digestive system to work when your heart rate is that elevated. So I normally tell clients to look and make sure that their heart rate is within a few beats of resting heart rate before eating. And I find myself where I'll sit down at the table ready to eat. I'm hungry. Maybe I waited a little bit too long. And then I'm like, okay, just sit here and breathe for a second because your heart rate's still at 100. Let's go ahead and try to get that down a little bit before I dive into this food. I also notice this with clients who are coming in from fasted cardio, for example, where mm -hmm. they maybe... They woke up and they drug their feet a little bit of, oh my gosh, I don't want to go out and do this. My legs are heavy. I'm too tired. The dog kept me up last night. I'm not speaking from personal experience <laughs> or anything. And they find themselves in a situation where they drug their feet and now it's been, you know, they've been up for 30, 45 minutes, whatever it is. And then they still need to go do 30, 45 minutes, 60 minutes of cardio and then come back and finally have their first meal. And so they go and do their cardio and maybe they've got it. They're uh, fortunate enough to have a treadmill at their home. And so they jump off the treadmill and immediately run upstairs to try and get their food in. And then they're like, oh, my, now my stomach is killing me. And it's like, well, really starting off on a bad note this morning. Mm -hmm. And so so giving yourself that time to get back down to a resting heart rate or within those couple of beats, like you said, is going to be very helpful. Yeah, 100%. And then being able to really dive into the chewing aspect. So we talked about how there's so many different organs that are uh, a part of the digestion process, but a lot of digestion starts in the mouth. And that starts with your chewing. And this was also something, again, we speak from experience here, that I would just basically like chomp, chomp, swallow. 
And you actually pointed it out to me of like, you're actually not chewing your food well at all. And I believe it was Alan Cress who had said like, your food should be near liquid before swallowing. And I was like astonished of just my food is nowhere near liquid before I swallow. Yeah, that is something that I guess I am very fortunate that I've never been like that. I've always been someone who is just chewing my food very thoroughly. I don't know what it is about me, but it's just something I've always done. Um, But it does make a massive difference. Yeah, because when we're looking at uh, digestion, I know I said it starts in the mouth, but it also starts within like the brain and the central nervous system because like your smells come into it and then looking into your mouth. Um, and so we, the easiest digestive thing is going to be a liquid. And so then it's going to be small particles and then large particles. And so being able to thoroughly chew things to get it to that small particle or liquid type state is just going to make things so much easier. And I'm sure you might have experienced this if you have like, let's say, a smoothie. And you're like, oh, that digested so well. But then when I'm eating something like a steak, I have a really hard time digesting that. But when we're looking at something like a steak, there's a lot of connective tissue there. And so you have to chew that really freaking well. Whereas a smoothie, you don't got to chew that. You can just swallow. And so being able to be conscientious of the type of food that you're eating, how much it's going to need to be chewed is all going to play into how well it digests. And speaking of liquids, what do you recommend within water intake or fluid intake as a whole? Yeah, being able to limit your water intake right around your meal. And I struggled with this just because meals would be a great break time for me. And so I'd be like, oh, a break, let me go ahead and get in some water. But what can happen is when you're drinking an excess of water, so what an excess would be, I would say is going to be like within your eating period of having more than 20 ounces of water in that time frame is probably going to be an excess of water. And so if you're downing 40, 50, 60 ounces around your meal, like right before your meal, right after or during your meal, that can actually... Define what you mean right before and right after so that people have an idea. I would say like within... 10 or 15 minutes before your meal and 10 or 15 minutes after your meal. I'm not saying like a whole hour or anything, just looking at that that 10 minutes right before you eat, the time that you're eating and that 10 or 15 minutes after you eat of being able to ensure that you're, you're not downing that water or liquids because that actually can wash away some of the digestive um, enzymes and juices that are going to help your stomach be able to get everything in the place it needs to be. So for the special case of our nurses who are listening that are having to run to the break room in between patients and they need to eat, but they also need to keep up with their water, how do you go about that? Tell them to take smaller sips and not to be gulping their water down. But it's also looking at the full picture of just one of these can definitely have an effect on your digestion. But if you're nailing down everything else to the best of your ability, again, we understand life happens and there's a reality to this. And so we need to work within the reality. But if there is a way that we can really be able to push water up at different times of the day of maybe it's, okay, before you go into your shift, we're making sure that we have at least uh, 30 ounces of water in Um, after your shift, making sure we get at least 30 ounces of water in. If you're training that day, getting in 20, 20, 20 around your workout, um, that can really help push that water intake up. So we're not waiting for all of our water to be right when we are eating those meals. But I do have nurses that do drink more water on those breaks because they're not allowed to have their water on the floor. Um, And that's just part of it. So we look at what else we can help in the meantime to make sure their digestion in the best place. And that wraps up tier one. And if we are able to address these different factors, I think this is a great starting point for everyone listening to enhance their digestion or be more aware of the different factors that are impacting their digestion. Yeah. And before we dive into tier two, are there clients that you've seen just implement these things from tier one who have come to you with maybe not the best digestion that have improved their digestion? Of course. I think that the main factors are going to be the speed, the chewing. I think the environment plays a role. It's something that with environment, uh, one thing that I I didn't speak a whole lot on uh, when we were on the topic was that um, individuals who are working in an office, it's kind of tough for them to not eat their 
maybe lunch at their desk. So oftentimes what I recommend there is for them to go on a like outdoor walk afterwards to help with the digestion process. If they can get outside and just get some sunlight and go on a five or 10 minute walk, I find that to be helpful from an environment standpoint. Um, What have you seen within your clients? I actually just had a client that I onboarded and she is really struggling with her digestion. And I looked at her food logs and there was a few things that we could move around, namely her her fiber of how it was allotted. But a big part of her digestive issues from her onboarding came down to she wasn't drinking enough water throughout the day. Um, her sleep was in a great spot, but she also was speeding through her meals. Um, she wasn't uh, dividing them up as well throughout the day. And there was a lot of these aspects of just not chewing her food that we, once we address, like things are going to be golden and we won't have to really change much within food. And she was thinking, oh, I have all these food sensitivities. I need to go on an elimination diet or I need to take away all of this food. And it was really great to be able to say like, hey, like we could have an issue with food, but let's look at these things first and get these nailed down. And let's see where we go from there because I do see it so frequently that these affect people's digestion even when food is in the the best spot that it can be. Excellent. Where are we starting with tier two? Stress. Stress, stress, stress. Rearing its ugly head. It just affects everything. Sleep and stress just like to be a part of everything. They have FOMO. They want to be involved. They just want to be a part of you. Uh, So stress and sleep management are going to be so, so important, Um, and those both fall into tier two here. So when it comes to stress, stress can affect every part of the digestive system Um, because digestion does start in the brain and the nervous system, and your gut is its own network of neurons, the intrinsic and enteric uh, nervous system. And so if you're stressed, it can put you in that fight or flight mode and instead of that rest or digest that we talked about. And this can cause a decrease in blood flow and oxygen to the stomach, which in turn can cause a lot of cramping and inflammation and a lot of other issues when it comes to your stomach and just not being able to truly digest it. Because when we look at our lives as a whole, or we look at uh, that fight or flight that I'm talking about, our body looks at stress as stress. It can't always discern the difference between a bear is running after me and I am in fight or flight mode and I am really stressed about life right now. It just notices there is stress present. And so when you're looking at like the bear example, if you're running away from a bear and a bear's coming to you, your body is going to prioritize the different things that you need to get away from that bear. And that does not include digesting your food properly. It is focusing on getting blood to every other part of your body to get out of dodge. And so again, your digestion is deprioritized when you're in that high, high stress place or you're in that fight or fight place. And so being able to get yourself into a few beats of resting heart rate, being able to be in a calm space is going to get you in that rest or digest state so that you can really process the food that you are eating. So Coach Sue, If I have a situation where I've got two kids, I'm a single mother, and I'm really struggling with my digestion, and there's not a whole lot from a stress perspective that I can do that I can change, right? What are the suggestions that you make to that individual to try and improve their digestion and mitigate some stress in any different way? So I understand that someone might not be able to do a ton about their stress, but there are things that we can do within breathing practices to be able to get you into a better spot. And I I get it of being short on time and having a million things going on and a million other people you have to be... uh, responsible for as a whole, but you also have to be responsible for yourself. And in order to be able to help the the other people that you need to help, you need to be able to help yourself. And so being able to take a few minutes or a few seconds of just let me take a few deep breaths before I eat this meal, or let me focus on my my core and my breathing before I go to bed for a few minutes um, before I close my eyes, that's going to put you overall in a better position and a better ability to handle stress. 
stress. And so being able to look at this of not, oh my gosh, I can't remove all the stress from my life, but more of what are these small little things that I can add to my life to be able to help with stress. Um, And another thing that I often recommend is let's make things easier to digest. Let's not eat things like steak that's going to be really difficult of you have to chew and break down. If you're on the go, I'm going to push you more towards liquids or things like a ground meat instead of um, like a actual meat. I'm going to push you towards a ground meat or something like fish um, or something with just less connective tissue. That's going to be a lot easier to digest for you to make it easier on you where we can. Are you wanting to hire the last coach you will ever need? Well, look no further. Physique Development is here to help you. We have a huge emphasis on knowledge and communication and making sure you know how to get yourself in the best position so you never have to hire another coach again. If this sounds great to you, then go ahead and fill out the inquiry link in the show notes or the description box, and we would love to get on a call with you. I love that. I think that another thing to add is training intensity Yeah. alongside that. I think that that is something from a stress perspective that we have complete control over of how it's being applied to the body. And so if you're an individual who's in a similar state that, you know, that client example was in, it would be in your best interest to not be pushing yourself a whole lot from like a volume perspective within your training or pushing yourself to failure and, and putting yourself in a very sore muscular position after every training session. It's going to be a time for you to back off a little bit and be in a more recoverable place, maybe focusing on more restorative things like yoga or things of that nature for your physical fitness at this time, as you can maybe navigate a little bit better through the stresses of life and those different factors. But what if training is my stress relief and I don't want to take down my training intensity? Bummer. Bum Bum city. Yeah, bummer. It's it's one of those situations that I have this conversation consistently with clients that it's even though you feel as though that it is a stress relief for you, putting yourself, tearing down muscle tissue and just continually not recovering is not a stress relief to you. It's just adding more compounded stress on top of your already high stress as a whole. Yeah. And this is something you have personally gotten so much better at of navigating your training intensity with your stress as a whole, because that used to be one of your only outlets for stress relief. And it it still can be a a, a degree. Yeah, to a degree. It's still a stress on your body, but it can be a stress relief to a degree. Uh, But you've gotten a lot better of just having different uh, things that you can turn to when it comes to your stress and recognizing that it's really not going to help to push the envelope. Yeah, it was, I mean, it was all the things that I thought were foo-foo previously. It was a bunch of stuff that I thought amounted to nothing. And so I knew the best way and me training hard and going ballistic in the gym was the best way for me to handle it because it's always how it worked. And I think that that was one of the greater blessings that 2020 gave me is that we were ripped out of the gym. I could not use that for a stress relief perspective. I was under a lot of stress and realizing like, oh my gosh, I have no tools to manage this. I'm not well equipped enough to manage these things. And so getting to a place where I was utilizing journaling, I I went through therapy at that time um, and just different modalities, getting outside, getting steps in, working on my breathing, uh, meditative practices, those different factors uh, were a massive help for me and figuring all that out. So yeah, as much as I would love to tell every person, like go in there and just rip apart the gym and, and use all of your aggression. There's a a time and a place always for, for that situation, I think. Uh, And I think that it gets less and less as you get older. (laughs) Um, but it is something that you can't always just run to it when stress is high because it is also a stressor. Yeah. And that's something where we're going through a lot of stress right now. And I've been wanting to just be super consistent in the gym. I know it's something that makes me feel better, but I've also had to be aware of my body is literally at its stress max. I can't push the envelope as much as I want to right now. I want to go in there and train. I know that I'm really setting myself back if I do go and do that. Right. And I think it plays a massive role in my digestion as a whole. Like I can notice in 24 hours, the difference that in a high stress state, how my digestion feels, how I'm feeling after a meal and those different factors, um, and, and how my bowel movements are. And then 
as that stress drops off or, or something changes and I'm able to do a better job of handling it, how different my digestion and how I feel after meals is. Yeah, a hundred percent. I can notice that, which we can go into sleep as well. And this is one that is like one of the hugest movers for me when it comes to my digestion. If I do not get good sleep, my digestion is likely not going to be great the next day whatsoever. Um, and within sleep, I know that I've said it a multitude of times, but it's for the elite. It's not for the weak. It's for the elite. And when we look at sleep, we want to be able to think about Again, all of the things that it affects. And like I said, within stress and sleep and sleep specifically, it affects almost every single process in the body. Thinking about something that it might affect, it probably does. So being able to take a look at this, um, sleep not only is going to increase your stress, which again, like we just mentioned, is going to play a role, but it can also disrupt your hunger hormones, um, have you crave more processed foods, it can create inflammation, um, and it can disrupt how your digestion is regulated because there's a reason that we don't just eat the whole day. Our body needs time and rest from eating to be able to digest and be in a positive spot before eating again. So that's why we space out our meals instead of, again, having them all back to back to back. And this is something that I've noticed within people who snack a lot or graze a lot of their digestion not being the best. And it can be because they're not giving their stomach a break to be able to digest that food. And so if you're not sleeping, you're not being able to get your stomach um, that full rest overnight. And then when it comes to the morning, you might feel either really high hunger, really low hunger, or just feeling like your stomach hurts more than anything. One of the things that I notice the most is that if I have back-to-back -back nights of poor sleep, then at that time, that's where I find myself in a situation where all I want is sugary, chocolatey things. Regular food does not sound good to me whatsoever. I want a candy bar. I want chocolate cake. I want all the things that make no sense for me to want, but it's the only thing that it seems appetizing to me at the time. And so that's one of the biggest tells for me that my sleep is tremendously off is that my appetite is kind of skewed as well as my hunger signaling is all over the place. It, and it's, it's interesting because when we talk about those hunger signals being off, it can go different ways for different individuals where for me, oftentimes when my sleep is off, it's not a matter of I am just ravenous for all food and I can't turn it off. It's actually the opposite more often than not that I have no appetite and I don't really want to eat anything besides those you know sugary foods, if you will. And so realizing which one you are in that uh, game, if you will, and understanding the the feedback loop that you're in of like, it's not that I'm actually you know, craving more and more food. It's just that I need to focus on my sleep. I need to eat my normal meals as I would on a regular day and then just get better sleep tonight. And then I'll be able to get back into alignment the following day. So let's say that you have a client that has had three or so nights of not good sleep. What would you suggest that they do from there? The first thing is keeping it as simple as possible getting to a place where hydration is still the, the main focus, focusing on hydration, getting outside and getting movement. I think that the worst thing that you can do after a couple nights of really poor sleep is letting yourself kind of sulk in the situation. Like you still have your duties that day to get done and you've got to show up. It's just the reality of it. And the situation is the situation at hand and, and spending too much time on, well, I, I didn't sleep all that great last night is just not benefiting you. It's the reality. And so getting outside, um, getting hydration in, and then keeping the meals as simple as possible, prioritizing probably protein. And then if you can, you have macro allotments that you're wanting to hit, doing your best to stay in alignment and have a very structured schedule to that eating uh, arrangement, if you will and uh, focusing on keeping things in foods that you know you digest well. Try not to go outside of your norm. Try not to uh, fall behind on calories and be like, all right, well, I'm still gonna hit my calories now. I'm just gonna order a pizza and I'm just gonna you know, have one big meal and call it a day type situation. Trying to stay in the same regimented structure that you would have normally taken on a day that you did sleep well is gonna be the best way to go about things. But I think that prioritizing hydration and movement outside on those days is going to be the best for you to get your circadian rhythm back into sync because that's going to be a big part of this um, if it is falling out of sync if you will and getting to bed at an early time and not trying to uh, if you've fallen behind on food not trying to play that catch-up game 
getting to bed because now we could be hindering the next night of sleep if you're getting a bunch of calories in right before bed and now you're you know having trouble falling asleep or what have you. Yeah, 100%. I think that's really helpful. And that's something that you've led through example within that of those nights or multiple nights you get in a row of no sleep. You kind of have a checklist of what can I do to, to show up for myself to make sure my sleep is in the best spot. And it's all of those things that you do. Yes, I think that the other aspect, if you are going to train on the day that you haven't had multiple nights of not good sleep, I think that there's there's research that uh, the mass research um, group has group <laughs> that mass research has just reviewed recently going over how sleep is impacting training and those different factors. And some of that research that they had in there off of one night of not so good sleep, it was pretty much okay. You were able to still train at the same intensity, provided that the next night you got good sleep. Uh, a mul multiple nights in a row of not good sleep did hinder training performance uh, to a degree. And so understanding that, go in and focus on the movements themselves, probably not pushing yourself for PRs being the best situation over multiple nights. Again, off of a single night of poor sleep, probably still go in there and train hard. It's You're probably going to be okay. Multiple nights, this is where you have to be a little bit more cognizant within your training. And so understanding that too is that if you are going to go in and train, move your body, uh, perform the movement patterns that you were uh, scheduled to hit that day and just take it for what it was worth and be able to get in and get out, maybe a shorter session for you, but at least you got blood flow and those different aspects, got a little bit of physical activity and uh, get back and train the next day. Yeah, 100%. So what are the other two things, or at least one other thing in this tier that you um, really double down on clients with when it comes to their digestion? I would say the breathing component. I don't even know if it's necessarily that I double down with clients, but more so myself. I am someone who I unknowingly just don't breathe deeply. I'm someone who is a little bit more short-breathed and, and my brain is going 20 thousand miles an hour all the time. So it's one of those situations that I have to be very cognizant of my breathing. And this is a big part of the digestion component as a whole. Yeah. And this is something that I've been working on a ton is my my breathing and my core engagement and just being able to make sure that I'm breathing with my diaphragm because the way you breathe is going to affect like your nervous system as a whole and how it responds because you can push yourself into that fight or flight by not breathing properly of breathing a ton with your chest or with your belly, not having deep breaths like you talked about and not being able to really engage your diaphragm as you're going through a breath pattern, which is what I was talking about within like the stress of being having a super crazy schedule and you can't really control a lot of it. You can control your breath. And I am a big believer that if you can control your breath, you can control so much of how you respond and react to things. And I've seen it firsthand in my own life. I've seen it firsthand in your life. And it has just been really powerful to see how just something as simple as something you do a million times a day of breathing that can change your quality of life, your digestion, and so many other factors, as well as breathing being one of the big drivers of your posture of if you are going to be breathing with your diaphragm, that's going to positively affect your posture. And that takes us into the last point of this tier. How does posture impact our digestion? slouch posture or poor posture can trigger heartburn and acid reflux, as well as poor posture is going to put pressure on your abdomen, which is going to reduce the function of your stomach, and it can lead to gas, bloating, constipation, and a ton more. So if you're in a place that you are constantly slouched over your desk all day, or you have not ever paid attention to your posture a day in your life, and you're like, why do I have gas all of the time and feel awful? It could be as simple as your posture and being able to, to make that more of a focus. It makes a big difference. Yeah. So to recap these two tiers here, um, the environment, your heart rate, the speed in which you eat, your water intake around meals, your chewing and how well you chew your food, as well as your stress, sleep, posture and breathing. So all of these things are going to be habit and routine based and not even looking at the actual food that you're consuming are all going to play a role within your digestion and are all going to have an effect on your digestion. 
that wraps up tier one and tier two of the digestive starter pack series from us. And in part two of this, we're going to get into tier three and tier four. In tier three, we're going to actually start talking about food and getting into macronutrients and how we can distribute them throughout the day and how we can do best to optimize our overall digestion. In tier four, what are we going to be doing? We're going to be looking into supplementation, the fun stuff, as well as digging in to see if there might be something past these tiers that might be going on with your digestion and some different hacks and other things to consider when it comes to your digestion. Excellent. If you guys have not liked and subscribed to the channel, we would greatly appreciate it. If you're listening on your favorite podcast platform, leave us a review and we appreciate you abundantly.